Okay, um, thanks again everyone for sticking with us today. Um, had a few technical issues, but now hopefully solved. Um, if everyone could mute who's not um, speaking at the moment, that would be really good. Um, so welcome to all the clubs and all the players that I know that we've got from across the region today um, for our latest Essex uh, webinar series. So where we'll be looking at the future um, of what the future looks like for girls and the part um, for all females for cricket in the East. Um, it's been a while ago now that the new East uh, regional centres were announced. Um, so I know a lot of you wanted to know a little bit more about what they were and where they sit, what they'll be doing over the next couple of years. So we'll be looking at that and then what happens beyond that. Um, from a county level, we're not really going to cover much because, um, as I said, we're, we're talking to people from across the whole of East Anglia and everyone does things a little bit differently as to what suits them. So um, we're just going to go from the next stage up now. Um, but just a just a quick note that over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of collaboration between the counties, which has been, um, we're at a stage where we have a regional girls EPP and a regional girls academy. Um, and that's a great base now moving forward to the work that um, the Sunrisers will now take on. Um, I might be a bit biased on this, but I do think that we've got the best panel um, of all our webinars so far. Um, so a quick introduction to those. Um, today, first up, we've got Danny Warren, who used to be the manager, women and girls manager for Middlesex, um, and has now just been appointed as the regional director for women's cricket in London and the East. She's going to talk about a bit about her new role, what the regional develop, um, what the regional centres are, and like I said, their plans over the next couple of years. Um, from the ECB, we've got Beth Barrett Wild, who is the head of the women's hundred competition. Uh, but more importantly, she's an ex Essex player um, and was part of the Kelvin and Fearing crew that dominated the Beaumont Seymour Championships um, many years ago. Um, we've also got Trevor Griffin. Uh, he has a ridiculous amount of experience in the women's game, so we're really excited to have him on today. Um, he was a head coach at Sydney Thunder in the um, women's big bash. Uh, he was the K uh, Kia Super League. Western Storm coach, um, taking them to the last ever uh, final last year. Um, and more, more relevant now, he's the London Spirit head coach. So we'll be hearing from him. And then last but not least, uh, another local legend, Maddie Villiers, um, who obviously plays for Essex, has played for Surrey Stars and more recently England. So we're really excited to have her. Um, and also, as you might have seen from the London Virtual Championships lately, um, she's a very good runner got some very quick times in that so um and also just for the local people local um Essex players and clubs that are on Beth used to go to Culture County High School and Maddie is from Shenfield High School so we've got some good representation on the panel today um so Danny if you are ready uh, oh I'm sorry before that if anyone's got got any questions please put them on the chat and we will try to get to them um at the end if they're not covered already by um people today so um over to you danny thank Thanks. you very much nat uh, first of all please be nice to me i might not have essex blood in me but um i've i've visited the county a few times um if, if that helps and i mean on the wrong end of defeats by um essex so um yeah, be, be nice to me, even if I'm not originally from there. Um, so anyway, thank you for inviting me. It's um, it's really exciting to be able to speak to uh, speak to everyone here and um, and share a little bit of um, the vision that we have for um, for the Sunrisers and where we want to take women and girls cricket across um, across our region um, and give you a taste. I, I'm told I've got ten minutes, so I'm not going to be able to give you too much information in this time. I could probably talk all day about it, but this hopefully gives you a flavour, gives you a background, and I will no doubt speak to many of you again in the in the future. So um, just just to mention my role. Um, I, I have come from working um, with with Middlesex um, with their women and girls in the performance side of things. Um, I've I've actually spent about twelve years working in cricket full time. Um, I've worked in the participation side. I've worked in the performance side. I've been a coach. Um, probably more importantly, I've I've been a player. So I've been where you guys are um, throughout my life. I started playing when I was at primary school and um, enjoyed. 14 odd years playing county cricket so um, completely understand the importance of a pathway and the importance of knowing 
um, where your where you can take your game and your your progression. So um, I, I'm also a a big cricket fan. A, um, I, I think tragic is the word, badger is the word, whatever it might be. I I, I love watching cricket and talking about cricket. So um, with, without taking up too much time, um, a brief overview of my role. Um, I'm I'm responsible for um, a senior team in the region um, who will compete in the women's domestic um, competition. Um, in terms of the responsibilities there, I get to do really fun things like um, coming up with a new brand and, and deciding kit. I also get to do not so fun things um, like organising training schedules and um, talking to, um, to partners and, and um, businesses. So um, it, it's a very varied role from what I've worked out in the first two months um, anyway. Um, I will be overseeing um, and working with coaches and talent managers across our performance pathway. Um, more about that coming up. Um, and I'll also be heavily involved in helping influence our county age group pathways the regional participation growth and also looking at the workforce and how we can improve that across um, london and the east so a couple of missions from sunrisers um, in terms of where we want to go on the field successful and entertaining we all want to um to see a team that plays good cricket um and plays cricket with a bit of freedom and from that, it will inspire those who, who aren't on the field to either say, I want to be out there or say, I want to follow these guys. So we want cricket to be a key part in, in everybody's life um, around the region. Um, to be able to identify and develop cricketers um, within our region. And I know there's a lot of talent. I've worked on the RDC over this winter. Um, I've seen the players that are coming through and I know there's a lot of talent in our area. Um, to go on and represent the Sunrisers, to represent um, London spirit um, and to go on and do what Maddie's doing at the moment and represent England. Um, and then onto the pathway, it, it's for me, this is the most important part of the role I've got as you guys need to be able to see where you can play cricket, um, get into cricket and be able to achieve your dreams through cricket. Now, please excuse my really bad Google Maps thing, but I thought I would draw a map of the area um, and, and have a look at, at what we have in terms of space. Now, the, the dots and the stars won't mean all that much at the moment, but it gives you an idea of the region that we cover. Um, it gives you an idea of the places that when I'm allowed out of my front room, I'm going to go and visit. Um, I might need a new car by the end of, by the end of this year, um, but it, it certainly goes to show how, how our region is split up. Um, and some potential areas of where our programmes might be. So please don't take these as red because there's so much more work that we need to do to identify the best place to deliver programmes. But what we will do is try to bring them to you. We will, we will try and position them in areas where it's accessible to as many people as we can across the region. Now, talking about those programmes, um, a little stab at a pathway. Um, and I, I apologise, I... I wish I had a deck of PowerPoint slides that had consistent colours across. Um, by the end of this month, we will have a logo, we will have a brand, we will have a big launch. Um, and then I'm going to have a fancy deck of PowerPoint to, um, to use. For now, I'm picking the best colours I can find and um, doing my best there. Um, from this, you'll see, from a Sunrisers perspective, we, we've got three programmes. We've got the senior team. Um, we'll have an academy, which will have roughly 20 to 24 players in it. Um, and we'll look to run that in two centres, um, one on the east side, one on the west side of the region. Um, and we'll have an emerging player programme that, again, will allow us to access more players. And again, we will look to position that initially in two, two areas, but we may look to be able to expand that into four areas um, when we can grow the programme. Another way of looking at it and a way of looking at the staff that we're going to be able to engage um, We've obviously got a county age group based programmes and that's where we're all going to start. That's where I started, it's where Beth started, it's where Maddie started. Um, working through that, we've now got those steps on the ladder. The, the emerging player programme takes us into the academy, takes us into the senior team and, and hopefully Trevor's on board with this, will take us into the, uh, the London Spirit team as, as well. So we're, we're going for the first time in, well, the history of women's cricket have a regional workforce that can work up and down this pathway, a head coach that, um, that will be able to look in on the academy and the EPP, see the players that we have there, to have talent managers that can get into your counties and work with your coaches and help build up a really, really great system that supports talent across the region. Um, and that's not to mention the dreaded S&C coach um, who will uh, make, you, make you run um, and all of our other support coaches as well. 
I could go on all day about player selection, but I, I know it's something you guys probably want to have an idea about. And um, the, I guess the catch line is that um, we want to have the most open process we can um, with transparency throughout. Now, something I've learned in the last few months is that um, you, you've got to adapt and um, all we will be is honest and transparent, depending on um, how well we can get out and about this summer. We will make sure we're, we're doing our best to, to see you guys. Um, Around all of our selection will be a player profile. And this, this will take time to build into um, what we want it to be, but it will start with being talent ID'd at your county. Once you've been talent ID'd, that will take you over to a nomination to the region where we'll get to see you. And then once we've seen you, those who've seen you will be part of a selection committee, um, which will lead into selection. And most importantly, we never want to talk about it, but with selection comes deselection. Um, and that's how a pathway should be. Um, a pathway needs to allow players to come in and out at the right time. And it doesn't mean that um, the door is closed at, at any point. Some key dates for this year. Um, and again, please forgive me as a lot of this is very reliant on the, the current situation in the, in the country, but um, certainly our hopes um, around selection um, sit here. Um, for, a, for a senior team to represent the Sunrisers this summer, um, we'll very soon be going out to counties to ask for nominations um, to, to be considered there. Um, these will go to a selection committee um, in July and we'll look at selecting in August ahead of a competition. Um, looking at the winter, again, we want to make sure we do get observations in, so we may be taking a bit longer to select than normal, um, but again, looking to make sure we've got um, nominations in that will then allow us to make a selection ahead of the end of 2020. Um, probably more relevant to you guys at this stage, but um, just equally important, the, the Academy and EPP nomination process um, likely to start in September. Um, anyone who's had experience of the Regional Development Centre process, it's going to look very similar. Um, unashamedly, we're learning from that experience and we're going to take all the great things they've done and, and, and do that. So nominations will come in from your counties. Um, we will work with your counties to help them identify the players best suited to the environment. Um, observations will take place, um, profiles built up, selection committee discussions, and then a selection um, be made. And then finally, just to sort of finish with a, a bit of a tagline and a couple of um, key points for me, um, that we're, we're here to, to foster talent through opportunities. And the more opportunities we can give players across a pathway, um, whether that be in clubs, schools, county cricket, the Sunrisers, all the way through to, to, to London Spirit, the 100 and, um, and England, then talent will, will prevail. Um, for me, a, a pathway has to be a pyramid. It has to get tougher the higher up you go. Um, and that's going to be very important for everything that we're looking to build within our programmes. Um, we want to be really robust in the way we monitor our players. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, for the first time in the history of women's cricket, we've got a highly skilled workforce that we can, we can call upon to bring their expertise to the region. So that, that kind of sums up where we're, where we're at at the moment. Um, and yeah, really just to say that I'm so excited to be able to go on this journey with, with everyone across the, the, the East region. And I know that um, while we may not have seen talent rush to the top, it's there and it's being nurtured. So I'm so excited to be able to, to keep um, Keep, keep doing the, um, the job that um, Essex and your coaches have already been doing. Hey, thanks, Danny. Um, and then following on from that, obviously the next stage then is the 100. If you're successful in the regional um, pathway stage, then hopefully you're going to get picked up at the next stage. Um, Beth is hopefully going <laughs> to tell us about the 100. Yeah, I'm off. I'm off mute. Can everybody hear me? Just a few thumbs up. Excellent. Um, okay, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Beth Bright Wild, and um, as Nat said, alongside being a very proud, born and bred Essex girl, I'm head of the hundred women's competition at the ECB. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, Nat's asked me to spend a little bit of time um, talking about where the hundred, and in particular the London Spirit, fits within our new plans for the professionalisation of the domestic women's game. But I actually just wanted to start by saying, as I'm sure is probably the case of a lot of people on the call today, um, I found the last 12 weeks or so um, really challenging. In a very short space of time, we've gone from gathering some real pace and momentum around building some really extraordinary plans 
for the launch of the 100 this summer to unfortunately making the heartbreaking decision a few weeks ago now to postpone the first edition of the competition to 2021. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the detail of exactly why that decision was made. I think it's pretty um, obvious given the current circumstances. And I'm sure that everybody on this call has probably read a thing or two about the 100 over the last few months. Albeit I would urge you not to believe everything that you read about the 100 in the press. But what I do want to do is spend a little bit of time giving you some context um, about the role and the purpose of the 100. And in particular, looking at why it is so important for the transformation of the women's game. So first, just taking a quick step back, um, a reminder, or for those that um, aren't aware, the 100 is the ECB's brand new short format professional cricket competition. It's going to feature eight brand new city-based teams, um, and they're going to play in a really exciting new 100 ball format. And from my perspective, and hopefully for everybody on this call today's perspective, I think the really um, the best thing about it is that it's been launched from the very start for both men and women. So the eight teams um, that will be taking part in the 100, they align geographically exactly to the eight new women and girls regions. So Danny's just talked you through the pathway for the Sunrisers. Um, so here in the East, that means that that Sunrisers structure is directly aligned to the structure of the London Spirit team. Um, indeed, prior to the postponement of the competition this summer, the county grounds in both Chelmsford and North Hants were due to host three London Spirit women's matches between them, or actually I think it might have been four. Um, and these venues remain firmly within our plans for 2021. So there's that direct connection there. What it also means is that we can look at how we want to set up the Sunrisers and the London Spirit coaching and support staff structures. So just to make sure that we're making absolutely the best use of all of our resources, our budgets, etc. So it might be, um, as I think Danny's slide just now highlighted, it might be that there's one head coach that sits across the Sunrisers senior women's team and the London Spirit team, or it might be that there's one physio that looks after both teams. And I know that that is something that Danny's looking and working really hard on behind the scenes at the moment to make sure that we get that structure just right. In terms of player selection, so how do you actually get to play in the 100 and the women's comp? Well, the structure that we have is an open market signing system with a standardised salary band structure. So that is a bit different to how it's been done in the men's. Um, a few of you might have watched the men's draft event back in October. Um, we have had a, a more open market process. But what that means is that any player based anywhere in the country can sign for any of the eight teams um, and that they can ne negotiate directly with that team. So it doesn't mean that just because you live in the East, say, and you get selected to play for the Sunrisers one day, that you automatically have to play for the London Spirit. You could end up playing for any of the teams across the 100. Um, and uh, Maddie Villiers, who we're uh, very fortunate to have on the call here today, she's another great Essex girl, but um, she's actually signed up to play for the Trent Rockets in the 100. So it just shows that there isn't necessarily that immediate link. However, um, my instinct is that actually over the next few years, um, as everything develops and grows, I think we'll start to see more and more overlap um, between the two teams from a playing perspective, as, especially as we see sort of young up and coming, coming talent coming through the structure, coming through those local pathways, playing county age group girls cricket um, and through the regional structure. So I think we'll see more and more player overlap as things go on. The second thing that I just wanted to touch on um, is just a reminder really about what the real purpose is and the long term objectives for the 100, um, particularly relating to the women's game. So as reiterated by ECB's Chief Executive Tom Harrison over the last few months, um, when we emerge and as we emerge from COVID-19, there's going to be an even greater need for the 100. Um, I truly believe that our survival as a game in the long term is going to be dependent on our ambition to build on growing, cricket's growing fan base. And I think this is even more relevant and indeed crucial for the growth of women and girls cricket. The 100 gives us the opportunity to create profile, visibility and scale like we've never seen before. Partners such as the BBC with free to air coverage and Sky Sports will enable us to catapult women and girls cricket to a new and wider audience. And I just want to reiterate that the women's comp within the 100 is absolutely not an afterthought. Um, it is part of the very diverse fabric and tapestry that makes the 100 the innovative and diverse and representative events that it is. When I first started in this role um, around 18 months ago now, um, I actually identified four key objectives when I first sat down and I was like, what, what will success look like for the 100 and the women's comp over the first five years? And I just want to sort of go through those with you now so you can really see the scale of our ambition here. 
So first of all, world-class quality. So we want to set the 100 up as the premier domestic women's cricket competition in the world. We want to be the best. And that's not going to be easy. Um, we've got some stiff competition, especially from a uh, small competition, which uh, Trevor Griffin actually coaches in, the Women's Big Bash League down in Australia. But I think that's something that we really have to aspire to. We have to aspire to play on that level and to create that scale. Secondly, more people watching. So we want to use the 100 to increase the reach of women and girls cricket by attracting greater attendances in ground, larger broad broadcast viewing figures and a greater public profile. Thirdly, more people playing, and this is something that's really um, close to my heart, and it's something that I care a lot about, but we want to use the hundreds and the London spirit in particular across the East region to inspire more women and girls than ever before to pick up a bat and ball and to fall in love with the game like I did 20 odd years ago. So how can we use the hundreds and the London spirit across the community to really create those connections and to connect the, the top of the game through to the grassroots? And then finally, revenue generation. Um, and this is probably the most difficult one of the lot, but we want to use the 100 to start creating a sustainable revenue generating product for the women's game. And like I said, that's not gonna be easy, um, especially in the current climate, but it's something that we really need to start addressing. How do we commercialize women and girls cricket to create a stable financial platform moving forwards? Um, I just wanna finish um, by saying that I don't believe that there's ever been a better time um, to be a female cricketer um, at every single level of the game. The opportunities, are, they're huge, they're massive, they're, they're bigger and better than they ever have been. Um, having personally fallen in love with cricket 20 odd years ago now um, and actually grown up aspiring to be Michael Atherton, who was the England men's cricket team captain at the time, I think we're really fortunate that young girls um, across the region picking up a bat and ball for the first time today, they don't have to look to the men's game for their inspiration to play anymore because we have some incredible female role models um, playing cricket. And through the 100 and London Spirit, I think this group is only gonna grow and we'll have those local heroes that yeah, young girls can properly aspire to be one day. So yeah, whilst it's been really disappointing and um, that our plans for the 100 and the launch of it this summer have had to be put on ice, I'm now really excited and looking ahead to 2021 and making sure that next summer really does represent another truly game-changing moment for women and girls cricket that I know it can be. So uh, that's it from me, just on the 100 stuff. Um, Nat, am I passing back to you? Yeah, thank you very much, Beth. I think that was a really a really good piece on, on the 100 and what an inspiration it can be to the girls around the county. Um, and the whole cycle of um, more girls playing means more girls that hopefully from this area will represent at a higher level in future, but also they will then inspire the next generation to then play even more cricket. Um, just on that, with all these new opportunities, the stuff that Danny's just covered, what Beth's been talking about, um, there's only so still, although there's a lot more than before, there's only so many places that will be available to those coming through. Um, but there's so many more options now for girls to stay in cricket without actually playing cricket. Um, so there'll be more coaching roles, more photographers will be needed. Commercialisation of the game will mean that we need some more business people involved in the game. Um, Beth, you, you've had a few roles throughout um, before you got to this one. I don't know if you just want to give us a, a, a couple of those, um, talk us through a few of those, just to give the girls on the call on the webinar um, an example of what else they could possibly get involved in. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've, um, I've been very fortunate. Like you said, I've had quite a few roles now um, working in cricket, but actually before I got, um, got into cricket, uh, I did a geography degree at university, so nothing to do with sport. Um, but I was very sporty growing up, so you've mentioned that I, I used to play, I don't play as much anymore. But I think from a very young age, um, I actually wanted to either play in a World Cup final at Lords, um, probably with the boys, because that's um, what I thought I'd be doing, or I wanted to score the winning goal in an Olympic hockey final. So unfortunately, neither of those two things happened, but it meant that I always wanted to work in sports. So off the back of my geography degree, it gave me a really good grounding um, in terms of being able to kind of uh, reason and write and sort of articulate my thoughts. Um, but clearly it wasn't a direct pathway into sports. So I knew I wanted to work in sports. Um, all of my friends were going off to be doctors, investment bankers, management consultants, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that just wasn't quite for me. So I was very fortunate that I got an opportunity um, at university to be our sports federation president for a year. Um, so that gave me a good grounding. But then off the back of that, I actually, my first proper job, I suppose, out of university, I worked for Rounders England, um, the national governing body for rounders as a regional development officer so I actually looked after the whole of the east region here 
and um, so I moved back in with my parents um, in Kelverdon and sort of yeah sort of tried to meet round as a really a really massive sport here which it was amazing I had a great kind of 14 months there just learning about sports development grassroots sports development in particular um, kind of yeah that inspiring everybody to want to play to play sport um, but then from there I got an, an opportunity to work at MCC in the media and comms office so it was a bit of a switch across but obviously I was very happy to, to get back into cricket so media and comms background um, had a little stint working with the England women's uh, cricket team as their media manager um, which I think I, I kind of described at the time as the best job in the world because it meant that I got to travel the world and I got to go to, to sort of, yeah, World Cups etc um, but <laughs> without the pressure of actually having to play in a World Cup final which I kind of realised maybe that, that bit wasn't actually for me but that was an amazing opportunity, amazing grounding um, and yeah since then I've had lots of other chances at the ECB um, and I think that's one thing I would say actually is um, as a, a woman in particular working in cricket there are a lot of brilliant chances and opportunities out there now. So um, it's it's kind of really just sort of nailing down what, what space you want to work in. Is it in media? Is it in comms? Is it in marketing? Is it in the development side? Um, is it in event management? So I worked on the Women's World Cup in 2017 as well and sort of behind the scenes in a strategic role there. So yeah, I mean, I'm sort of waffling on now, but lots of opportunities. And I think that's, that's what I just said. I'd be, Sort of anybody on the call today that isn't quite sure what they want to do but know that they want to work in sport it's just about being really curious um and sort of being really open to trying different things like i didn't you know i didn't grow up thinking that i wanted to be a development officer for rounders but that gave me 14 months of really good grounding and meeting people understanding the sector understanding how things went together and it was a really good foundation to then um, build on where i am today so yeah um just be curious really and and open to different things awesome thank you very much beth that's it really important thing i think is because there's so many opportunities now in cricket and and for the people that maybe aren't on the um elite pathway um you can still be involved in the elite pathway and that's what we really want to see going forward <clears throat> okay thank you beth um so trevor we're coming over to you um like i said you've obviously worked across a whole range of top level um female teams and um, just over the last couple of years what have been your highlights and what are you most excited going forward in the next couple of years? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me along. Um, uh, unlike Danny, but similar to, to the rest of you, I, I am uh, Essex-born. Um, I moved to the West Country uh, with my previous job in 2002. Um, but up until then, I was very much a, an Essex boy. My family are, are still, in, it's still in Essex, so um, they are very close to my heart. Um, in terms of uh, the last couple of years, I guess the the biggest success I, um, or, or, yeah, this biggest success I've had is with Western Storm in the Kia Super League. Um, so I started out year one, which was what, 2016, as an assistant coach and an analyst. Um, I got asked to to help out basically, and whether I'd pick up a, the analyst role. Um, so a bit 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 similar to Beth, really. Bit of uh, being curious and an opportunity to experience a different environment and just take on those opportunities. Um, at the end of the first KSL, I got asked if I'd like to take over as head coach for 2017, um, and uh, which we was a successful season for us. So that was our, our first first trophy win, um, which makes it very easy then to have conversations with chief executives about a new contract and. Um, extending those when, when you've got the trophy sitting beside you. Um, so that was extended for another two years uh, and um, over the course of the four years of the KSL, Western Storm attended finals every single year and we won it twice, uh, 2017 and then last year, uh, 2019. Um, I've had opportunities to work in New Zealand uh, with Canterbury Cricket, mainly within the men's game, um, although I assisted more so and supported their women's setup, but uh, it was an opportunity from a development point of view to work in the men's game in Canterbury. Um, and from there, I was asked if I'd like an opportunity to assist in the WBBL with Sydney Thunder. Um, that was 2018. Uh, yeah, 2018. And then last year, I was asked to take over as head coach. Um, uh, uh, for, for Sydney Thunder in the WBBL. So that's sort of like a bit of a, a background really, but I guess what I would say to, to aspiring coaches out there is um, 
it, it can it can be quite daunting to put yourself out there, but um, uh, uh, seek different opportunities. I did a lot of volunteering uh, in the beginning, but that opened up doors and gave me lots of learning and, and different opportunities and, and, and build relationships. And you know, once you get your foot in the door, then various other doors start to open from there. So I certainly encourage coaches to to put themselves out there and experience different things. Excellent. Thanks. Um, and then going back to the pathway, um, how do you feel the spirit will work um, both sides of it? So back with Danny and the region, the sunrises, and then above that with England as such. Yeah. So from from my perspective, with with uh, London Spirit for uh, two thousand and twenty. So for this year, um, we didn't have the regional structure in place, um, but. For me, I think it's really important that we build relationships with, with all the pathways and with our, with our linked counties. So I, I visited um, uh, Northamptonshire and Essex uh, were two key, key areas that, that I visited as well as Middlesex. Um, just starting to build relationships with the coaches, but also getting to see the talent that's coming through. Um, but more so moving forward, that would, that would link more into the regional side of things and then from a London spirit point of view, being aware of what's coming through from the academy uh, side of things. Um, so I think this year was slightly different, but for me, I think it's really important as a head coach of a, of a team that's linked to a region that we're building relationships with everybody that, that has, a, has a link to cricket and building players for the future. Does that, does that answer that, Natalie? Um, and then for the girls, for the well, Natalie, you're breaking up. But I don't know whether that's me or yeah, what you. you. What, what advice? I think it might be me. Okay, there we go. I think, I'm back. I think you're back. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um. So for the girls that are on the pathway, and <laughs> no. I think you're there. Is this about um, okay. what they can work on? Yeah, yeah. So what, what advice, what would you want to see them doing at the moment? Sure. So I think that the one thing I'd say from a player's perspective and a, a coach's perspective is the game's changing massively as, uh, as we progress. And, you know, we're seeing you know, players being more inventive and creative with, with the way they bat. And we're starting to see more variation coming in, in from a bowling perspective. So. I think I'd encourage coaches and players to explore different things. Um, I think the one thing that you can't hide uh, nowadays is in the field. Certainly when I was younger, that uh, I could be put down a fine leg with my sweets in my pocket and hit, hit down there as a, as a batter. Um, but in the modern game with players that are ramping and reverse sweeping, there, there is no hiding place, I think, within the field. So I think... I think what, what we need to see from a fielding perspective is uh, development around athleticism. So it's not just general uh, fitness side of things, but you know, how players uh, move, their agility, their ability to go to ground, um, that commitment to, to throw themselves around, really. Um, so back to the old fashioned ABCs of agility, balance, coordination, speed, there'll be things that I certainly encourage players to work on. Um, as I said, that you can't hide within the field, and you know I, I think that's a key thing moving forward that we want to see our, our cricketers be athletic, a um, real, real athlete. Thank you, um, Trevor, and I think that's a, a very important thing, for, and it's something easy to do at home as well, especially in the current conditions, and um, to work on getting to ground and improving your athleticism as well. Um, <laughs> I think just, just quickly on that, one thing I, I've sort of seen and, and, and experienced myself as a club coach, that you have a wet weather day, so we cancel training. Well, actually, rather than cancel training, let's still keep the players in. We can indoors do a bit of tactical work with them. I can remember using a pool table and putting the pool balls on, on the table, and we were talking about if a batter did this, what sort of field would you be set in, and we just moved the pool, pool balls around. And then... Um, just towards the back end of it, we'd make sure they come in old clothes and then we'd get them outdoors and we'd get them sliding. Um, and that's the best time when it's a bit wet, a bit greasy, um, safer, um, they come off 
certainly the younger players come off a bit wet, a bit muddy, big grins on their face, but it's a great opportunity to do that type of work with the players. Are you still with us now? Yeah, and it makes it really fun as well, so hopefully they're, they're going to enjoy that. I'm hoping so. I think so. Um, okay. Uh, no. You're just about there now. Keep going. Just about there. It's just internet. Um, <coughs> Okay, so I think that's um, a few of our questions. We've got a few more coming later that will hopefully um, you'll be able to answer as well. Um, but over to Maddie. Thank you, Trevor. Um, obviously, today you had the announcement that the England women will be returning to training. Um, what are you most looking forward to or what have you missed the most? Um, yeah, thanks for having me first, Nat. Um, it's been quite interesting, really. Um, yeah, so we go back next week. And I'm quite interested to see if I can actually play. Um, you go such a long period of time not playing or not doing anything. And when you go back, it's like it will take a few take a few sessions to get back to it. So I've got zero expectations for the first week or so. But yeah, just looking back, looking forward to getting back to it. And there's about six of us that are going to be based at the Oval. So just getting back with with the group that I'm going to be with and just getting back to playing really. So... Yeah, take what I can get at the minute. Excellent. I'm sure a lot of players have been feeling the same as well. Um, in term, um, the last couple of years, sorry, have been um, obviously a bit of a whirlwind. Um, playing for the Surrey Storm in the KSL and then obviously on to England. Um, and getting into the World Cup. What have been, what's the most key highlights for you? Um, I think that, Super League final for me was a real turning point in in my development that really gave me the platform that allowed me to get into the academy and, and take things further. So that Super League final was and that Super League season to be to be perfect um, was was a massive turning point for me. And then um the my debut, you could, I can't look look much further than that to be honest. That was um yeah, that was pretty special and something that I would never have thought would have happened. So, yeah, I say that I don't really remember it, which is probably true. I only really remember it because I can watch it back. Like, adrenaline's a funny thing when it takes over. Um, I can only remember, like, snippets of Heather talking to me before bowling or I don't actually remember remember bowling. So, um, yeah, so they're probably the two main um, highlights for me. Excellent, thanks. Um, what so now that you've travelled a bit and you've been um, chatting, obviously to a lot of other players, um, and it's something that we always notice that the younger girls don't, don't generally tend to chat to other players too much from other teams and take advantage of that. What's have you picked up any really good tips from other spinners that you've met over the past couple of years? Um, well, I've worked with Laura Marsh for the Super League, and she. Literally, she got me through that first season. There was times when I didn't, I, I still to this day don't know what I'm doing sometimes. So she's so level-headed and so calm. She just, yeah, she really got the best out of me, I think, in, in that first Super League. And yeah, some of the stuff that she's taught me and how to approach games. And, and I never used to do any of the analysis stuff, so I'd never really do my prep beforehand. And she taught me the importance of actually doing that and going into the game with an upper hand rather than getting caught on the back foot in the game. So, yeah, that would probably be one of the main things is doing your prep and it is, it is pretty important as much as it's the, the stuff that you don't want to be doing the night before, you probably just want to be chilling. But, yeah, so that's, that's the key for me, the prep. Excellent. Um, and for the girls in the pathway, you're probably playing the same girls every year. So hopefully you can do your own sort of mini prep before or start to think about what players are doing. Um, we've had a few questions in. Um, so to you, Maddie, from Emily in the Essex Under 13 and also at Shenfield High School, um, did you always play within a boys team? And if so, what age, if at all, did you move to girls only? And then to the others, anyone else um, on the panel that wants to jump in a, are there any thoughts on mixed junior and adult cricket and the development for um, 
players. Um, I didn't actually play any boys club cricket. I played, I was fortunate enough to be in an all girls side at Bentley and I played in a few other clubs as well. I played boys cricket at school and I played up until I left, I played boys cricket. I think it's so important to put yourself in an environment that's so competitive and it just, yeah, when I'm in a competitive frame of mind, it brings the best out of me. Um, so yeah, I think I wanted to play as much boys cricket as I can. I played, I did play some men's cricket actually for, um, for a side and I, I played two or three games, but it just, it wasn't for me because yeah, yeah. at the time I was probably not wanting to play cricket anyway, so that, that wasn't beneficial for me. But yeah, like if as, as long as you can play boys cricket, I highly encourage it because it just sets you up in the long run for for the competitiveness and the, the pace of the game. Like women's, women's and girls cricket is coming on massively, so over the next few years you probably won't need to play boys cricket, but at the moment, um, yeah, play for, play for as long as you can. Excellent. Um, Danny, Beth or Trevor, anything to add on that? Um, yeah, I think I, I would echo um, exactly what Maddie has said there. I think the women and girls game, we've seen the, the pace of change um, especially I think over the last five years and how the, great, the game is really developing and the opportunities to play are developing and I don't think there's as much a need as when I first started playing um, to have to play boys or girls cricket, I think you can choose. Um, I think from my perspective, so I can see Chris Lefwich is on, is on the call here, he's the chairman at Kelvin and Fearing Cricket Club, um, which is where I um, first started playing and look, I was very, very fortunate that I had a brilliant experience there. Um, but I was the only girl in the club for quite a long time. Um, but they do have a brilliant women's section now and a girls section. But um, I think, yeah, in terms of playing um, and whether you should play or not, or whether there's a hard stop that you should, you know, play mixed cricket and then stop playing. I, I don't think there is a hard stop. I think it is what's right for um, each individual player. And if you're getting the opportunities and as Maddie said, you know, sometimes playing men and boys cricket, it does just push you that little bit harder because it's perhaps um, the bowling's a little bit quicker or they, they might hit it a little bit harder and it, it does just help just elevate your skill level. So I think it's an individual decision, but um, yeah, I, it's, the game is changing. So hopefully in sort of, yeah, five years time, um, you won't necessarily have to play men and boys cricket, but right now I don't think there's any harm in doing that. I, I, I agree with all of that. I think, yeah, I, I thought it can be quite contentious. Um, we are seeing the growth of the, the women and girls game and there's more opportunities now for the girls certainly to, to be playing cricket. Um, I think it needs to be appropriate that, yeah, that if the girls, if the player is strong enough, then giving them the opportunity to test themselves in, in different environments. Playing cricket at the highest levels, international, you know, Maddie, Maddie can contest, uh, uh, confirm this. And, and in the WBBL, it's tough. It's really tough out there. And playing in the, the men's and the boys' environment, it is tougher. They do hit the ball harder. They do bowl it a bit faster. And they're perhaps not forgiving if you drop the catch. Um, so I think it, it takes players out of their comfort zones and puts them into different challenges. And you know, as, as the best players in the world, can, speaking to the best players in the world, that's one thing they talk about is um, being able to take on the tough, tough challenges. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we've just got just under five minutes left. So I'm going to speak through a couple of um, questions and hopefully I can come back to anyone um, that sent some in um, that wasn't covered. Um, firstly, one from Georgia from the Norfolk Under 11s. Um, Maddie, what age did you single out cricket as your main sport if you did? And to everyone, what are your thoughts on playing different sports? Um, is there an age where you do need to choose or does it depend on the level at which you play the sport? So, first to Maddie, did you? Have to? Did you clash at all? Yeah, it did. When I when I when I was in Shenfield, I played all the sports, but football and cricket were my two um, main sports that I loved. And for as long as I could, I played both of them because I thought it was important to get a balance and choose the sport that was right for me. Um, and I think I was in year year nine that I made a decision to completely stick with cricket. Um, yeah, and as as long as you can play the two, then then go for it as if, if it's not too demanding and and it's doable then yes play all the sports <laughs> Excellent. yeah I think play play as many different sports or and do as many different things as you possibly can um, I think there's a number of benefits in terms of um, 
you know, the skills you develop will be in hockey, with your hand-eye coordination, uh, the way you move, that's going to benefit cricket, tennis, you know, you think about a forehand down the line, very similar to running across, picking up the ball and throwing it cross body. So that's a good thing from that perspective. So there's a number of, all the sports have lots of crossovers. So I think it's important for them to experience that. Um, uh, as well as from a, uh, the social side of things and, and interacting with different people. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then I think last question probably. Um, we've had one that said, uh, any advice for players that uh, may be trying to combine pursuing a cricket career with either academic studies or with work? So anyone's got any advice on that? I'm probably not the best person to give advice about that. I'll that <laughs> to someone else. <laughs> Um, I suppose I can talk in terms of um, sort of growing up through school and university and combining playing cricket and hockey to a fairly high level and, and studying. Um, I just got very good at time management. So I was even laughing the other day. I'm actually um, locking down back at my dad's house um, in Kelvedon and just talking about how, yeah, on, on the way to matches, etc. I did all of my, my homework, my coursework, etc. actually in the car. So just got quite good at, at balancing and time management. Um, and I guess it's, yeah, it's just about almost having, being very structured and just very clear on, on timetabling. And I know that sounds really boring and dull, but there is time in the day. And I think it's, you know, I used to get frustrated when you hear people saying, oh, well, I haven't had time to do my running session because I've had to go to school or do X, Y, Z. It's like, well, you could get up early and do it first thing. Um, so it's just about sort of, yeah, being very clear about what your objectives are, where you want to be, where you want to get to. And look, if you want to get to the top at, elite level sport you are going to have to put the hours in um, and combining that with with studying and, and work etc um, it's it's tough it's difficult it's, it's about juggling but um, I think it is possible um, and I think just as sport professionalizes um, yeah opportunities will become more frequent but it is something that's yeah sort of education etc is crucially important as well excellent yeah. I was going to say like, we're at a really exciting stage where we're able to start to offer professional contracts out and I think one of one of the best parts about this is it does give those players the freedom to focus 100% on cricket but as Beth said it, it's totally possible to balance both um, being organised, being aware of where you want to go and, and a, a couple of bits of advice will be when you train make sure you train with a purpose that you know what you want to get out of it because we've we've probably all seen those players who turn up and go through the motions and if you're if you're juggling your time you you can't afford to do that and the best players who who really know what they want to get from every minute that they're working on whether it's in the gym whether it's on the running track whether it's um in the cricket nets they're they're the ones who get the best out of their time um, but finally also just remember that the third thing you need to juggle is your own personal life because as trevor mentioned earlier around the social element of cricket is you need to be able to to, to have that element as well cricket is a sport that the, the more socially aware players are the ones that um, that, that will find it easier to adapt to those challenges as they as they go through. Okay, um, we've had quite a few questions in now that we're just not going to be able to get round to, but I will. Um, I've taken. I've got another one coming in as well. I will take um, take a photo and try and get back to everyone on those and forward it to the panelists so that they can um, help you with those. Um, just a massive thank you to you, Danny, Beth, Maddie and Trevor. Um, it's been really good and I'm sure we could go on for hours on, on these questions. But um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. hope everyone uh, found it beneficial. Um, and we will see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.